Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan Fishman. I am the New England Director for Johnson Well Campaign. I want to thank you all for coming out. They were said, is there going to be an issue with the weather? And I said, New Hampshire, Liberty? No, not going to be an issue at all. So, please come in a little bit closer. Thank you all for coming out here. I want you to know that we are geocaching this on Instagram, so, if you have, or Snapchat, if you have the ability to do that, please tag it. Let everybody know that we're going out there. One of the things that makes a big difference for us is our volunteers actually support the campaign and get the message out there electronically. So, the, peop the people that... The people that you came here to see. It's amazing how that works. Thank you. So, the people that you came here to see, let me introduce Ms. Leslie Marshall, Governor Bill Weld, and the next President of the United States, Gary Johnson. And uh, I also want to say thank you so much for coming out and uh, risking what is really not very scary weather. But uh, it's really great to be here. In, uh, I'm Leslie Marshall, by the way, and I'm married to Bill Well. Okay, I'm Leslie Marshall, and I'm married to Bill Well, the vice presidential candidate. And I'm really excited to be here in New Hampshire. Uh, my father is from New Hampshire, so I love always being here. Um, but I'm really, really excited to be here today uh, for one of okay. um, because I can really sense something very exciting and new starting to happen in this election season. And I have to pause right here and say, to be honest, this has to be one of the strangest, most befuddling election seasons I've ever experienced. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I know it must be strange and befuddling because Yesterday was the first time I ever spoke at a political uh, rally, and I'm doing it again today. So, um, but, uh, but like you, I've been watching the campaign of the two major parties over the last year. And like you, I've been talking to friends and strangers. Everybody's talking about it. And our reactions have all been pretty similar. I mean, it's almost as if we feel like we've been strapped into some kind of twilight zone, weird roller coaster ride. And with each dip and turn, feel a different queasy feeling. I mean, uh, you know, first you feel surprise. You know what, I'm gonna put my glasses on. <laughs> surprise, I can't read. Um, <laughs> uh, surprise, are these really the Democratic and Republican Party's final nominees, the alleged finest leaders our country has to offer? And then alarm, please, did he, she, the official nominee really say that? And then disbelief, wait a minute, if it turns out he, she actually did the thing that she, he, she has been accused of, wouldn't that be criminal behavior? And then, and then dismay. Dismay is the, is the thing I hear most. And everybody's saying, help, you know, this is really not funny anymore. This is getting really, really scary and I can't change the channel. Um, so here today, guess what? I think you're going to learn that as you listen to Gary Johnson and Bill, you're going to learn that you can change the channel. And uh, I think you're going to experience some of the emotions that have been notably lacking from the contentious campaigns of the two major parties. Things like hope and optimism and purpose and excitement. Uh, those hope, optimism, pur purpose, excitement, those are what you should feel when a practical vision for real growth and change and prosperity is put forward in a calm way by experienced, capable leaders. And here's the thing about Gary and Bill. They are calm and capable leaders. They've each served as two-term governors of New Mexico and Massachusetts, respectively. And they each have real executive experience, which is not a claim any other candidate in this race can make. And it's true. Um, and they were both highly effective Republican governors in blue states. And this means that they understand the necessary alchemy of bringing different people with different agendas together so that they can form compromises that result in real action that actually bring good things to good, good people. So they're not, they were not just powerful and effective in office, they were also very popular. They were both re-elected by wide margins. And they're popular in part because they are likable, nice people. I mean, imagine that, it's hard to imagine, right? Um, 
Well, they're going to tell you a lot about the, the qualities, how they are distinguished from the other candidates on the policy and political fronts. But there are a few uh, qualities that I know they won't brag about for themselves. So very quickly, I'm going to brag for them. Gary and Bill are both honest, almost brutally so. They both sub subscribe to the theory that you always tell the truth, then you don't have to remember what you said. <laughs> and Gary and Bill are both honorable to the bone. And really, isn't that a basic quality that any presidential candidate should have? I think so, yeah. to be elected public servants. They do not think that the presidential race is a game of thrones that ends with a huge coronation. They want to be public servants and, and work for you. Um, they both have a lot to say, but they both listen. They know that they can learn a lot from others and they're gonna seek out the best advice from a variety of thinkers. They both have open minds, they both have open hearts, and they both believe in total transparency. Yeah. So, sometimes they both try, try to disguise this with this sort of quixotic goofiness that they both fake. Um, but they are both extremely intelligent in a sheer gray matter sense. I mean, Bill used to be famous with his friends for playing three games of chess simultaneously while blindfolded. And last week, Gary and Bill played against each other, chess, for the first time in New Mexico, and Gary won <laughs> quite, quite easily, I think. Uh, so, they're, they're good friends, they've known each other since they were governors together, and they enjoy each other's company more and more, I can see it as they spend time together, and they respect each other's opinions, and they plan to combine their judgment and experience and govern as a team. Yeah. So... One last quality I know they won't mention that I think is one of the most uh, important. They're both incredibly capable, powerful, accomplished, but they are two of the kindest men you'll ever meet. And I don't know about you, but I think kindness should come first. Almost all. Just before I do, I want to point out what I think is maybe the most extraordinary and exciting aspect of the Johnson Well team. And that is that this ticket is really an unexpected gift. Uh, it, it's an incredible opportunity for all of you, for all of us in the country, to show, step forward and show that as citizens, we can and do think and act, not just for ourselves, but for the greater good of the whole country. Yes. And there is no constitutional law that says a president must be bought into office from one of two long-standing parties. There is no guarantee that any party or any governing body, body no matter how noble it was in its conception, will never, over time, become ossified, self-serving, and ineffective. In fact, history shows just the reverse. Change and evolution are as inevitable in political systems are they, as they are in everything else in life. And in political systems, as in everything else in life, intelligent adaptation is the key to survival. Uh, I know this is not a state where people need to be told to think for themselves. I'm aware of that. But please consider that in this extraordinary election season, each of you has the power to help the country adapt, not just to survive, but to thrive. By being bold enough to vote for the candidates you feel are best for the country, regardless of any rigid assumptions about party affiliation, you can help overhaul the rusted old machinery in Washington you can help replace those misfiring spark plugs and the busted transmission and fill the empty tank so that we can all move forward. I hope you will feel the hope and optimism and purpose and excitement that are popping off the team of, of uh, Governors Gary Johnson and Bill Well. They're on the ballot in all 50 st states and the District of Columbia. vote for real change from experienced leaders who are also honest and honorable. Vote for the team that asks not what their country will do for them, but what they can do for their country. And now, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce my better half and our next Vice President of the United States, Bill Wells.
maybe. Well, that was an address full of true facts. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in New Hampshire uh, after only a short absence. I was up here fishing uh, just a few weeks ago up in the great metropolises of Surrey and Gilson. But uh, uh, one reason uh, it, it is a great pleasure to be here is our, our informal motto around libertarian headquarters is live free. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is live free or die country, and we are very much uh, at home here. I've spent a lot of time campaigning up here over the years with various New Hampshire candidates, and I, uh, I take the measure and the timber of the people, and they are really our kind of people, which is why you're going to see us back here often between now and November 8th. Further to what Leslie said, I do feel both hope and excitement, uh, and I'm filled with happiness these days, uh, because I think things are happening, and Gary and I, in a way, are breaking a glass ceiling in making uh, the world safe for uh, alternate voices, in addition to the monopoly parties uh, in Washington, who've done such a great job delivering uh, with their partisan uh, uh, hype uh, the last 10 years. Uh, that's a joke. <laughs> So we do offer uh, a, a mix of policy uh, views that is not represented by either other party. Uh, we not only say that we are fiscally responsible and conservative, we can prove it because both of us were two-term Republican governors of blue states. We succeeded Democratic governors. Both of our states were in a fiscal hole when we took over. Uh, in my case, I remember cutting taxes 21 times, cutting spending. Uh, at the beginning of my first term, uh, Massachusetts had the highest unemployment rate of the 11 industrial states. At the end of my first term, it had the lowest because people... Yeah. Have... <laughs> one, of, uh, one of my uh, slogans when I was in office is there's no such thing as government money, there's only taxpayers' money. And it's good when government... Yeah. Serves... posted in both the major party headquarters, uh, I suggest. Uh, on the social side, uh, you know, uh, the Libertarian Party is synonymous with liberty and freedom, and we really feel that uh, whatever views anybody wants to have on uh, gay marriage, abortion, uh, immigration, difficult issues, that's fine as long as they don't try and force it on others and rub anybody else's uh, nose in it. the American people how they feel about things, it turns out that 55 to 60 percent of the people in the United States identify with that combination of fiscally responsible and socially inclusive. 55 to 60 percent. That's a pretty big addressable market. Yeah. Gary likes to say that we really have a six-lane highway going right up the middle between the two uh, monopoly parties. And it means that what we have to do is uh, get in a situation where we can speak frankly and openly uh, to them with the whole world watching. And that means getting into the presidential debates in, in September and October. There's, there's a lot of ways to do that. One way is to poll at 15% nationwide. Another way is to poll over 15% in a certain number of swing states. Gary right now is polling at over 15% in five or six swing states, so that test is already for the man. He is, he is polling at, at 11, 12, 13 percent in recent polls, and that's with only 30 percent of the people in the country knowing who he is. When we get out there and spend money the next month and crisscross the country, get that figure up to 50 percent, his favorable is going to go not to 15 percent, but to 20, 25 percent. commission in 2013, uh, the Annenberg Commission, that made recommendations to the presidential debates uh, body uh, about rule changes they should do, and you know, they had people from both sides. 
and they recommended that the percentage be lowered to 10% for the first debate. And that would put us in right away, and with the name recognition that Gary got from the first debate, he'd go to 15, so we'd be in there all the way. So that'd be another possible avenue. Uh, a fourth avenue is people may start to take note of the fact that the debate commission is a, a tax-exempt entity, so they have to be nonpartisan. And the thought has crossed my mind and that of others that saying we want only R's and D's, can't be L's, uh, uh, even if they're on the ballot in 50 states. That's not nonpartisan, that's bipartisan, and that's a violation of neutrality. straightforward way for us to get into debates is just the force of popular opinion. There's a poll that came out today that said that 62% of the American public thinks we should be in the debates. That's a big figure. Abraham Lincoln said, uh, without public opinion, nothing is possible. With it, anything is possible. Those are true words. September and October, we have no ambition short of running the table and winning the whole thing when we get there because we think we have winning arguments. Nobody can deny that we made a difference in our states. Nobody can deny that we worked across the aisle with Democrats to get stuff done, which they don't do so much in Washington, D.C. Nobody can deny that we were fiscally conservative, that we cut spending, and that we balanced the budget. That hasn't been done in Washington, D.C. in many decades. So we're not just you know, saying, here's a promise, uh, uh, as from the Democrats, as to all the wonderful things we're going to do for free, uh, or really a conclusory statement from the Republican standard bearer, just it's going to be great. No particular granularity about how we're going to get there, because frankly, I don't think he has the granularity. He just has the adjectives and the adverbs. No, no facts. But in our case, in our case, it's a settled fact as to what we've done, and I think that'll make a difference to the uh, voters when they really look at the situation. And I think the point that Leslie, my wife, made uh, is an important one: that this is a year when people have almost a responsibility to take matters in their own hands and think for themselves and make a considered choice. And people say, oh, isn't the vote for a third party a wasted vote? Well, it's really not. It's really not if the so-called third party is the one that you agree with. In fact, voting for someone you don't agree with, that's a wasted vote. point, we were asked uh, inside, we were doing a media avail by a TV station, what kind of America uh, do you want to have? Uh, and my answer was, I want to have an America where people's teeth are not set on edge against each other, where groups are not set against groups, where groups are not discriminated against as a group, uh, where everybody can pursue their own dreams and uh, freedom and liberty, where the, where the happiness and the prosperity uh, and the liberty of the American people uh, is maximized. Uh, where the individual can never be thrust in a corner. That's the essence of a functioning democracy uh, in my book. And, and, and that's the kind of America that I have in view. And frankly, it's not the kind of America that we've seen with the screaming match between the two major parties this calendar year. I think the American people, upon hearing from us and seeing us, will get the idea that with Honest Johnson uh, in the White House, that's, that's the name that's going to stick, Honest Johnson. <laughs> speeches out of the White House. There will be no more bullying and braggadocio out of the White House. There's just going to be good government out of the White House. It's a distinct difference in tone, and it's fueled by the man who's going to be responsible for making the prediction come true that we can run the table and win it all, and that would be the next president of the United States, Gary Johnson.
craziest election that you have ever seen. I mean, really. It's the most crazy. And how crazy is it? I'm going to be the next president of the United States. That's how crazy it is. Beyond my wildest dreams, Bill Weld is my running mate. We are planning a partnership here which is unique. You get two for the price of one. Uh, I am comfortable in my own skin telling you that I am the lesser half of the ticket and that's a good thing. Like I said, really a good thing. <laughs> you know, libertarians. Uh, libertarians, really, the, the big uh, six-lane highway down the middle. Uh, being fiscally conservative, being socially inclusive, and skeptical that these military interventions, that when we involve ourselves in regime change, it's ended up with a world less safe, not more safe. <laughs> fiscally conservative. I've I got, I, I got one piece of advice for everybody here today, and it's worth exactly what you're paying for, it, which is nothing. But the one piece of advice is, is that whatever it is that you know, whatever it is that you do, apply it entrepreneurially. There will never be a greater reward in your life, creating your own job, creating jobs for others. And when it comes to government, government can play a role in making that as easy as possible, and you have Bill Weld and my pledge that we will make that as easy as possible. Reduce barriers to entry, make it easy. The, the, the economy of the future, the sharing economy, Airbnb. Yeah. I mean, come on, the whole world wants to come and visit uh, Concord. The whole world wants to come to New Hampshire and visit. Uh, Airbnb affords that opportunity. Government gets in the way of Airbnb. I'm in uh, Baltimore. I'm talking to a young woman uh, who got her um, uh, doctorate in science. Uh, she had these horrible, she says, I have these horrible student debts, but I figured out a way to pay them back. Airbnb. Man, I, I have a pathway to paying them all back, but guess what? City of Baltimore stepped in and banned Airbnb. Well, that's that's government. No, it, it, it happens. Uber right now. Uber is being opposed by uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, I think the model of the future is Uber everything. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's allowing you and I, with what we know, to be able to deliver what we know to the end user without a middleman. We make more money. Uh, the end user pays less. I mean, it's a win-win situation. Uh, but in my opinion, like I say, that is the model of the future. Crony capitalism. Look, we're all against crony capitalism, but I think that the majority of Americans right now have associated crony capitalism and free trade as one in the same, when in fact they are absolute opposites. Crony capitalism is when the government gets involved, when the government picks winners and losers. Free market is when the government doesn't get involved. Right now, with regard to the internet, look, we all have an equal opportunity with everybody else in the world, right now because of the internet. I think the greatest freedom tool that has ever existed, and right now, I'll tell you what, there's a slew of legislation right now that is trying, or will try, to limit those, uh, uh, limit the ability of those to be successful on the internet. They're gonna try and limit that ability to those that have been successful and have made money count on Bill Weld and I to make sure that that doesn't happen as president and vice president. You know, when, you, when, you, when you talk about spending and when you talk about reducing spending, who are we doing that for? We're doing that for future generations. Look, we're headed to a fiscal cliff in this country unless we get spending under control. We're not going to have a health care safety net unless we actually address the entitlements, Medicaid and Medicare. Having a safety net for those uh, in need, for those on welfare, having a safety net for those over 65, yes, we can do that. Reforming Social Security, look, if we're gonna put our heads in the sand over this, and Clinton and Trump both are saying that they're not gonna address the entitlements. Well, if they don't address the entitlements, look, they're not gonna be around for future generations, and we owe that to future generations. So with regard to with regard to Social Security, I mean, you've got to raise the retirement age. You have to reform Social Security so that it will be around. Uh, with regard to Social Security, you could also have a very fair means testing. How much should you get back more money from Social Security than what you put in? 
Well, uh, you could have a very fair means testing when it comes to Social Security, given a certain level of income. You shouldn't get back more than what you put in. But there are reforms that can take place to ensure that we will have this going forward. Certainty in government. Look, we're not looking to get elected king or dictator. Uh, we're looking to get elected president and vice president, and there are constitutional restraints on being president and vice president. So count on us, count on certainty that when it comes to making taxes simpler, when it comes to lowering taxes, count on certainty that we will support lowering taxes, never raising taxes, never, never making uh, making life more difficult when it comes to filing taxes, when it comes to the IRS, making it easier to comply uh, with, our, with, our, with the rules, with the regulations. But if I could wave a magic wand, if I could wave a magic wand, I, I would abolish income tax, uh, I would abolish corporate tax, I would replace it with a federal consumption tax, and if we did that, I believe for no other reason, tens of millions of jobs would get created in this country. Because why would you start up or grow a business anywhere in the world, given a zero corporate tax rate in the United States? And who pays for corporate tax? We pay for corporate tax. Don't kid yourself. And if we had one federal consumption tax, no income tax, no corporate tax, pink slips would get issued to 80% of Washington lobbyists. Because... should be embracing immigration. We are a country of immigrants. So the notion of deporting 11 million undocumented workers has a basis in misunderstanding, in misinformation. These are people that are hardworking. They're just like you and I. You can't get across the border to get jobs that are there that U.S. citizens don't want. So you have to cross illegally to get those jobs, and if it were you and I, we would be doing the same thing for our families, for our betterment. Don't build a fence across the border. That is just a crazy notion. Donald Trump, <laughs> D Donald Trump had to watch the Olympics really, really closely to determine how high the Mexican pole vaulters could go. <laughs> easy as possible for somebody that wants to come into this country and work to be able to get a work visa. Yeah. And a work visa should entail a background check and a social security card that applicable taxes get paid. When the government applies quotas to immigration, there's problems with quotas. Look, no quotas. They'll, there will either be work or there won't be work. And right now, there are more Mexicans going back across the border into Mexico because there are more jobs in Mexico right now than in the U.S. And illegal border crossings are at a 10-year low at the moment. It's just not an issue. It's a political boogeyman that doesn't exist, and I am speaking as a border governor. Free markets. Free markets really is the key. He healthcare. Uh, President Obama's healthcare plan is, is, is it's a cat out of the bag. I agree with Chief Justice Roberts that it's a tax. My insurance premiums have quadrupled, uh, in, have quadrupled, and I haven't seen a doctor in three years. Uh, it's a tax. But if we are to reform health care in this country, and count on Bill and I, when it comes to health care, to sign on to anything that's going to make health care more affordable, uh, that, that uh, it's going to make for better health care. But here's how you make better health care. And that would be a truly free market approach to health care. Yeah. And by the way, health care right, right now is as far removed from free market as it possibly can be. In a free market approach for health care, you and I would not have insurance to cover ourselves for ongoing medical need. We would have insurance to cover ourselves for catastrophic injury and illness, and we would pay as you go in a system that I'm going to guess would cost one-fifth of what it currently costs. You would have advertised pricing, you'd have advertised outcomes. Right now we go to the doctor, we have no idea what it's going to cost. The person providing the services has no idea what it's going to cost. We get a bill and know that nobody is going to actually pay that bill. Well, if you brought a free market approach to healthcare, you would have Stitches R Us. You would have X-rays R Us. 
You would have gallbladders, R. Us. No telling what we would have, but I guarantee you, it would be advertised pricing, it would be advertised outcomes, and it would be much, much less costly. Yeah. Standing out in the rain, heck, oh man. Yeah! You, you do us honor, you really do. <laughs> Term limits is a silver bullet. Come on. Yes! Yes! If, we had, if we had term limits, politicians would do the right thing as opposed to whatever it takes to get reelected. We would not have a $20 trillion debt if term limits were in effect. Fiscally conservative, socially inclusive. Socially inclusive, what does that mean? It means that people we should be able to make choices in our own lives on everything. On everything. Unless those choices put other people in harm's way. That's when government has a role. But with regard to choices, believing in marriage equality, believe in the, believing in the constitutional right of marriage equality, abortion, how can there be a more difficult decision in anyone's life and anyone, that would be the woman involved on whether or not to have an abortion but who, other than the woman involved, should be making that choice? No one but the woman involved should be making that choice. Let's legalize marijuana in this country. We have tens of millions of Americans in this country who are convicted felons that but for our drug laws would otherwise be tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. Right. We, have, we have mandatory sentencing. Let's give discretion to judges when it comes to sentencing. Let's do away with mandatory sentencing. The biggest category of prisoner in federal prison today is the individual who has sold small amounts of drugs on numerous occasions and been caught. Victimless, non-violent crime. As President of the United States, as Vice President, we're promising to deschedule marijuana as a class one narcotic right off the bat. The legalization of marijuana will be a state's issue similar to alcohol. That's just the way that it that it, that it will be and the way that it should be. States' rights. Yeah. And in the, in the context of states' rights, I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice. That we should allow alternatives to public education. Yeah. Unleash a million educational entrepreneurs to deliver better products and better services when it comes to education. I can't believe we're still doing the bricks and mortar thing, kindergarten through 12th grade and then moving on to higher education. We can do better than that. But what is it, what is it that the federal government should do when it comes to education? Not to be there in the first place. New Hampshire, New Hampshire gives and this isn't just the Department of Education, it's the federal government. But New Hampshire gives uh, the federal Department of Education 13 cents, and then they get back 11 cents. How do you like that equation? And, and it, get back, you know, you give it to them in the first place, now they're going to give you back 11 cents. But then they tell you that you have to do A, B, C, and D to get the 11 cents, and to do A, B, C, and D, it costs you 15 cents. So how about leaving that six cents in the state of New Hampshire from the very beginning and let, and let states determine how they're going to spend that money? I mean, that would be a much better spent resource if that were the case. And there are some, there are some departments that stick out that should be abolished. Uh, and there are some areas in these, in these departments perhaps that should be retained, but in an, an entire agency, uh, the Department of Commerce uh, comes to mind, Housing and Urban Development comes to mind, Homeland Security, come on, do we really need another agency of the federal government when it comes to law enforcement? I don't think so. As governor of New Mexico, I came to recognize that the death penalty is flawed public policy. You may, you may agree with the death penalty, but you know what? There's an error rate when it comes to the death penalty of arguably 4%. 
I don't want to put one person to death to punish 999 that are guilty, much less four when 96 are guilty. When Governor Ryan, in the mid-90s, when Governor Ryan of Illinois uh, ordered a review of 36 inmates on death row, and over 20 of them were released because of DNA testing, and that categorically they were innocent, this is flawed public policy. It costs less to lock a person up for the rest of their lives than it is to put a person on death row and pay for the attorneys that go through endless appeal for those that are on death row, but then when somebody gets off of death row because they've been proven to categorically be innocent, how can you put a price tag on what has been paid to attorneys to accomplish that? Guns, Second Amendment, look, I support, we support the Second Amendment. But we've also got to be open to a discussion on how you keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill, and we need to be open to a discussion on how you keep guns out of the hands of would-be terrorists. The FBI in Florida, if I were President of the United States, I would want to know what transpired between the FBI and the shooter uh, in Florida. I'll bet the FBI has some real ideas about how we move forward. Obviously, the system worked up until a point, uh, but let's be prudent about that. The military. There was a poll among active military personnel two weeks ago on who they favored for President of the United States. I won that poll. Yeah, yeah. So what does that say? I think what that says is that these guys, Weldon Johnson, are going to judiciously use the military. They're going to use the military when we're attacked and we'll attack back. But when it comes to regime change, when it comes to being the world's policeman, look, this has had a really unintended consequence of making things worse, not better. Regime change, Iraq, you've got ISIS that flees to uh, Syria, Libya, or their numbers are strengthened in Syria and Libya. And you can't make this up, and it wasn't intentional, but Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, they went in and they supported the opposition in Syria and Libya to support regime change. We armed the opposition in Syria and Libya to support that regime change. And guess what? The opposition got beaten, and all of those arms ended up in ISIS hands. That's the unintended consequence of being at war all the time. Let's stop being at war. Let's bring the world together with free trade and diplomacy. And with regard to diplomacy, joining arms with Russia, that's how we're going to bring an end to the Syrian conflict. Joining arms with China to deal with what I think is the biggest threat in the world, which is North Korea, and the fact that at some point these intercontinental ballistic missiles are going to actually work. We have 40,000 troops in South Korea. There is zero chance that North Korea is going to invade South Korea conventionally. And if they start launching nukes, we've got them covered with our umbrella, but that's how scary this is. That's why this is the biggest threat in the country, because they may well start doing that. So there's an opportunity here to make the world safer. Imagine if China had 40,000 troops in Central America. We would be going absolutely crazy, and yet that's what we're causing when it comes to us being in South Korea and China. Has America ever been better? Has it ever been better? We get along better than one another. We communicate better with one another. Our kids are smarter than ever, and the number one law enforcement tool that we have is our smartphones in our pockets. And yeah, we've got problems, but you know what? We're communicating with one another better than we've ever done before, and we've got issues. One of those issues is, let me just say this, all right? All lives matter, but... Black lives matter. And the reason black lives matter is because they're getting shot at a rate six times that of being white. 
We've had our heads in the sand over the discrimination that exists. If you are of color and you're arrested on a drug-related crime, there's a four times more likelihood that you're going to end up in jail. And the, the, that blacks get pulled over inordinately. They get subject to arrest as opposed to those of us that are white. Let's not put our heads in the sand over this. Let's, let's recognize this and move forward. issues of late with regard to me and the campaign, and I, I love the campaign. I, I, I love, this is supposed to be an intellectual discussion about the issues, and so uh, with regard to a carbon tax, if any of you heard me saying I support a carbon tax, look, I haven't raised a penny of taxes in my entire political career, and neither has Bill. We were looking, I was looking at what I heard was a carbon fee that potentially from a free market standpoint would actually address the issue and cost less. Um, I have determined that, you know what, uh, it's a great theory, but I don't think that it can work and I've worked my way through that, all right? And I, I support a person's right to choose. So when it comes to vaccinations, all right, we should be able to make the decisions as to whether or not we want to vaccinate our kids or not. Now, I choose to vaccinate my kids, and you never say never. Look, in, in, um, in the case of a zombie apocalypse taking over the United States, and that there is a vaccine for that, as President of the United States, you might find me mandating that vaccine. I just want to do this in, in all... In all transparency, Bill and I are not planning an imperial presidency. My goodness, the President of the United States goes down to Walgreens and it costs taxpayers $10 million? Come on. There ought to be a much more affordable way for the President uh, to conduct his office. Count on us as good stewards of that office. Count on us in presidential, vice presidential role to spend less money in those roles than any other president, vice president that you've ever seen because this is about civil service and, and making a difference. <laughs> you all rock! Thank you so much for being here. gentlemen up here are going to change American politics and change your lives forever. But part of that change comes from you. So as the guy who's here to represent the campaign, I need you guys to sign up. johnsonwell.com slash volunteer. It makes a difference. If you can give us an hour a week, that makes a difference. If you can give us an hour a day, that makes an enormous difference. Think about what you're doing. Think about what you heard here and think about the change that you're willing to put in to make this country what we know it can be. Ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause for the next president.